It's six o'clock in Gibraltar. It's one o'clock in New York, 1 a.m. in Hong Kong, 3 a.m. in Sydney, 10 a.m. in San Francisco and 10.30 at night in Mumbai. Actually, it's probably 9 a.m. in San Francisco because this is one of those odd weeks where the clocks in Europe have moved, but they haven't moved in the United States of America. So greetings. Good morning, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where in the world you are today. My name is Patrick L. Young, the IPO Vid Livestream Series 21, Episode 3. That makes it a wonderfully beautiful episode one, two, three starts here. So what can I say first of all? Well, I'm back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all the shareholders of Valerium who delivered what I can only describe as proclamation by acclamation to bring me back and elevate me as CEO. I'm truly honored by the incredible outpouring of support. And well, after a week where roller coaster was an understatement, ladies and gentlemen, let's see what we can do as we try to restructure and rebuild Valerium. It's going to be a very, very exciting ride. And you probably guessed up front if you're a shareholder, here I am. I'm in Gibraltar. I've been visiting our headquarters today, and we're trying to do the best we possibly can to move the whole company forward. Unfortunately, we also had a very, very sad note last week for another Patrick from the parish, the most ghastly of news. I was deeply saddened to have to report the death of Patrick Burley last week. Patrick ran Safex. He ran, in fact, also the European Climate Exchange, whose founder is going to be our illustrious guest today, as well as running Nex Exchange. He was CEO of the London arm of LCH Clearnet, as well as working for LME and consulting for a long time to the LSEG and NICE Euronext. Our thoughts are with Patrick's family. He was a charismatic member of the Exchange Parish, and truly, the parish feels much, much the less without you here, Patrick. Chris Edmonds, on the other hand, he's added to the Chicago Exodus statistics with a move to the Atlanta headquarters of the Intercontinental Exchange. He's going to be heading up ICE's fixed income and data services business. Very, very exciting news with that big move to Atlanta. And indeed, also then we had the very interesting news that FTSE and TradeWeb are going to be having a strategic partnership. That the London Stock Exchange Group can have two arms cooperate mates and may not sound like much to you, but amidst the current balkanized silos of the LSEG Group post refinitive merger, having TradeWeb and FTSE Russell working together is good news and hope that there's some degree of synergy within the LSEG to come in the near future. Our guest today, ladies and gentlemen, is magnificent. Professor Dr. Richard Sander, the father of financial futures, a chevalier de la Légion d'honneur for his accomplishments in the field of environmental finance and carbon trading. Professor Richard Sander is known worldwide as the father of financial futures. Futures. Richard is the CEO of Environmental Financial Products, EFP, which was the incubator to the Chicago Climate Exchange and the American Financial Exchange, which he sold recently. Among Dr. Sanders' academic roles, he is currently the Aaron Director, Lecturer in Law and Economics at the University of Chicago Law School and an honorary professor at the School of Economics at Fudan University and the University of Hong Kong. Amongst a multitude of accolades, in 2002, Richard was named by Time magazine a hero of the planet. And in 2007, he was named as one of the magazine's Heroes of the Environment by Time magazine for his work as the father of carbon trading. The doc, as he is affectionately known in Chicago, has served on the board of directors of leading exchanges such as, good grief, what a panoply, the CME, ICE, CBOT, LIFE, the Tangin Climate Exchange, and I think actually he may have also served on the board of the Matif, if my memory serves me correctly. Perfect. Richard, good evening and greetings. Where in the world are you today? I'm in Sarasota, Florida, uh, speaking to you today on the East Coast time in the United States. Uh, Patrick, thank you for that lovely introduction. It's good to have friends. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to have friends across this parish? And it's been such good fun having these conversations for months on end. And here we are reaching a veritable crescendo for Halloween, Richard. And I have to say, I love that shirt. It's absolutely spectacular. I think, I think that shirt deserves an introduction of its own. It is an homage to you, Patrick. And, and <laughs> knew you might enjoy something 
that has a Halloween flavor and a bit of Basquiat uh, mixed in. Magnificent, magnificent altogether. Now, Richard, what a journey you have been on in this incredible era of, I think, the most exciting time in the history of the world of exchanges. But tell us, how did you get into financial markets? Um, by accident, <laughs> actually, Patrick. Uh, I did a, a, a doctorate at the University of Minnesota on the economics of science and inventive activity and was a student of microeconomics. I ended up uh, going to my first job in uh, the University of California, Berkeley, in the 1960s. Um, the uh, summer of love and hippies and uh, Herb Cain's uh, uh, version of beatniks going to uh, the flower children. Uh, I got there, Patrick, and uh, I started trading stocks and I did okay, but it was hard not to because it was the birth of, quote, Silicon Valley, literally and metaphorically, and every company was being developed. A friend of mine um, joined the faculty or he subsequently joined and he said well you're doing okay trading stocks but you really ought to try commodities and so i did all of the prep work and and i taught a course and ultimately a group of uh, the commodity club of san francisco came to me and they said you know, you know about the ag markets now and you know about equities markets. Bank of America is willing to give you a grant. We want to establish a exchange in San Francisco. Uh, Patrick, this was 69 and we'd like it to be all electronic and would you design the exchange and, and work on an electronic exchange in San Francisco in which we trade palm oil? Uh, and so uh, I designed one. I went back and forth to Chicago, trying to figure out, you know, how do I turn two bit at four into a, either a English-based auction with ascending prices or Dutch-based with descending. Modems were just there. Matching engines were peculiar. Could we design an exchange that was for profit and all electronic? You might imagine that 55 years ago, that was pretty revolutionary. Um, one thing led to the other, and living in Berkeley, you know, you really had unbounded and a permissionless environment. Uh, there was no such thing as norms, and I think creativity is driven in a permissionless environment. And so, I had watched interest rates move, um, and I thought, boy, California is a trendsetter. And while they had been quiescent from 45 to the mid 60s, that the world was changing. Uh, much like today, Patrick, overwhelming deficits, unpopular wars, you know, a change in society revolutions on campuses, it suggested to me that we would return to economic history with volatile rates. And also as a result of an earthquake in LA and constraints on insurance, I also began to be thinking and writing about catastrophic and weather derivatives having really in an open mind. One thing led to the other and the Board of Trade had hired 
a man by the name of Henry Hall Wilson. Henry was JFK's liaison with the house. They were professionalizing their, their footprint and he ultimately asked me if I would join the exchange as the vice president of research, the chief economist. And I said to him, Henry, I have two ideas. One of them is for futures markets and financial instruments, particularly interest rates, mortgages, et cetera. And also I'm very excited about weather and the movements of population, the long-term demographics, and that ultimately we needed alternative risk transfer mechanisms in the catastrophic and weather arena. And so, Patrick, I took a sabbatical for a year and it turned out to be 52 years later. <laughs> 52 years without any remission i mean good grief that's that's yeah. quite incredible altogether that's uh that's that's pretty much a life sentence certainly more than a life sentence if you commit you commit murder in in most european jurisdictions uh, yeah I, I thought it was you know okay i'll go there for a year and then in 73 happened i joined in the spring of 72 and and 1973 hit and all of a sudden interest rates started to become volatile and the prime hit 10 percent and all of those people in in the new york financial community that had told me it might be a better idea that I go back to the academic world because interest rates didn't fluctuate and there was no need to hedge. <laughs> oh, well. it's, it's fantastic, isn't it? It's one of those great contrarian moments when you see something like that happening, you instantly think I should be looking in the other direction. I noticed um, a couple of major multinational bodies have just said, Oh, we're looking at one hundred and fifty dollar oil, and I'm my contrarian in me instantly is thinking, "Wow, looks as if we must be ready to sell oil." Once you get those the catastrophisms, it's just incredible. But it's so fascinating, and 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 you know, taking a step back, I've got to say, you shared with me many years ago that business plan for the electronic exchange in San Francisco, and I loved it because you were going to use acoustic couplers and they had 1440 baud per minute which wouldn't be enough i mean if you give if you give a child a mobile phone or an ipad with 1440 baud per minute they would throw the ipad out the window in 10 seconds flat i mean it's absolutely nothing and yet you were able to engineer the first concept of an electronic futures exchange using that technology yeah, it was, I had partnered with a, a guy in, uh, who was in electrical engineering and computer science. He was a professor that uh, had sat in in one of my courses on, on technological change. And I said, why don't you handle the hardware and I'll do the systems design and we managed to get to GE and, and couplers and modems. And, and actually, it would have been feasible. Um, and they, uh, the founders decided that they didn't want to make the investment. The exchange ultimately did begin. Um, and like most new products uh, ultimately did not succeed. But you and I know that in these futures markets, if one is going to invent, one has to be prepared to look at the inventive process as a series of clinical trials and expect failures on a regular basis in the same way that anybody who invests should never expect all of the stocks they own to be winners. You know, being yeah. accustomed to challenges and losers is part and parcel of the inventive process. 
Precisely, precisely. But then, and it's also interesting because we look at so many products, and I think, again, there was some element of contrarianism there because so many products we thought were going to be slammed on great winners over time and ultimately didn't go anywhere. And then other products that people just threw out there because they were at either their wit's end or they thought, well, this is a logical addition to something else, have turned into great winners over time. Um, and, yeah, and indeed, yeah, yeah go yeah. ahead. This had, you know, a really a number of other significant challenges. You know, we think in the inventive process, starting an exchange or starting a new uh, product uh, or a new futures market, Patrick, is nothing more than, you know, a cost benefit. You know, what are the potential benefits and do they outweigh the costs? And if they do, then you can ultimately do something I don't know how that happened. Sorry, Patrick. Um, You're just a man in great demand, Richard. That's I, I, fine. I don't know, but but you've got to overcome. You know, the first the problem was that you had to have a regulatory environment back in. You know, Patrick, as you well know, I'm 700 years old. So back in the day, um, the Commodity Exchange Authority had designated products that it controlled and and it was based out of the department of agriculture because that was the history of regulation in america and i had gotten to know alex caldwell who was the administrator of the cea he came and spoke to my class at berkeley and with the advent of, of the Arab oil embargo, the breakdown of, of ban ownership bands of gold, uh, going off the gold standard, beans hitting, you know, record levels, corn, wheat, the anchovies stopped running in Peru, planting was late in the spring of 73, the harvest was late, Russia's crops failed, China's crops failed. It became apparent that there would be a new regulatory authority for organized futures markets. And uh, we had thought about mortgage futures, but and even floated a bill in, in Congress that didn't go anywhere. It didn't quite fit into a SEC or a Department of Agriculture, it would have needed something special. But the great sign in America, you know when you've arrived, when you get your own regulatory agents. <laughs> and, yes, yes. And, and it became apparent that this was one of these unique opportunities. Henry Hall Wilson was a legislator. He liked the challenge. Phil Johnson was at Kirkland and Ellis. And we came to the conclusion that the best thing to do would be to support re regulation, make sure it was intelligent, and redefine a commodity as not only this list, but anything intangible for future delivery. And that would allow for things like catastrophic occurrences, Ginny May futures, and write the legislation that had carved out what was the SEC, but anything that was for future delivery had the regulatory status of coming under the umbrella of this new agency, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. And given the birth and history, instead of the Senate Banking Committee, it would be the Senate Ag Committee that would ultimately serve as the regulator and to this day is, in fact, the governing judicial uh, uh, or uh, legislative uh, operator with regard to the CFTC.
And it's it's an incredible tale and, and one which, uh, well, actually, let me just briefly bring in a couple of comments that we have here, because first of all, we have Marcus Ward. Good evening, Marcus. It's lovely to see you today. Thank you very much for joining. Evening, Patrick L. Young, Chief Executive Officer. That's one of my lovely shareholders there, Richard, who was acclaiming me last week. But also, here's a great person, someone who was on this show just a few weeks ago, Anne Berg, saying hello. <laughs> hello, <laughs> hail, Richard. Kind <laughs> greetings. A message to you from Chicago there from another great commodity operator. Um, she's saying hello. And actually, that brings us, I suppose, to a moment where I'm going to give you a brief rest here, Richard, because I'm going to introduce our book of the week. Because as you know, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, have a book of the week running at the moment. And it's one that, well, one of two books, which Richard and I have discussed a great deal. The other one being, of course, uh, Jose de la Vega's Confusion de Confusionis. But in this particular case, we're looking at the magnificent book, which was, well, a, a Roman a clay. It was essentially based around the story up to that time of the great stock plunger, Jesse Livermore, and somewhat in a fictionalized version. It's an absolutely terrific read altogether, reminiscences of a stock operator. It has been a cult bestseller, I think, throughout the course of the last, well, seven, eight, well, 10 decades now. I mean, it's a century old, this book, first published in 1923. It remains an absolute must read. And indeed, quite fascinatingly, only recently we saw that Caroline Ellis she of the one of the many FTX folk who turned state's evidence against Sam Bankman-Fried made a remark on social media saying, reading reminiscences of a stock operator and it's disturbingly relatable. A tweet she gave out when, well, back in the halcyon days for crypto when Alameda FTX were at their high point of feigning solvency. Anyway, it's a great book, ladies and gentlemen, always worth a read. I thoroughly, thoroughly recommend it. And um, Richard, I think uh, that's that's a tome that you claim to be 700 years old, but it even predates you, that book, in the world of financial markets. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, it is a wonderful read, and, and I think... Uh, the audience would do well to follow your recommendations to give it a read. Thank you. So, I mean, Richard, it's incredible. You were there. You were the founder, the father of financial futures. You're acknowledged by the city of Chicago in that in that great role. But I mean, it was truly fathering because, I mean, there was an incredible amount of nurture and there were products that nobody wanted in the interest rate field, but eventually you find this fabulous niche. It must have been both the best of times and the worst of times, to quote another great novelist. Yeah, it, it was. And you might imagine uh, what it's like, Patrick, and I know you will find this uh, um, of interest, what it's like to be a uh, you know, a 30-year-old, a 31-year-old a kid walking into the hallowed halls of firms like Solomon Brothers and say, hi, I'm from Chicago and I'm here to narrow your spreads. <laughs> 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 not, not exactly a welcoming arms embrace Patrick because Ginny Mays were traded in first two dollar 98 bid at a hundred then the market began in 70 and then it it went from 98 bid at 99 but it was still being quoted in half point increments and the Chicago contracts were in 30 seconds Wow. And so you can imagine that if you were there to reduce the wholesale retail spreads, you would be turned around and sent back to middle America. Um, and But nevertheless, we gave access and, and there's lots of things that you need to do, Patrick, when you invent. In the case of financial futures, it took legislative um, uh, 
changes and regulatory changes and also a construct of designing an exchange. And while we didn't have an exchange, we did have Ginnie Mae permit holders. We had new classes of membership. And then, of course, you had to come up with a way to generate liquidity, which was a concept of cheapest to deliver, seller options, a lot of other things that created the liquidity between bid and offer that individual players could use, which served as the basis for the vast success of the introduction of the bond contract, uh, which built on the Ginny May cheapest to deliver concept and provided uh, liquidity for the treasury market. Yes, and of course, this was all at that incredible time when, in many ways, the greatest president in the history of the United States for financial markets, although an individual who gets a slightly different rap from the world of broader political historians, Richard Milhouse Nixon, did so many things that in their own way opened up the financial markets and truly created the derivatives world. It's not only that, Patrick, as a student of history, you know that he also fathered the EPA, you know, a very strange proposition of opening up capital markets, promoting environmental causes, introducing Mao to Kissinger. (laughs) (laughs) Quite a a portfolio of of different... skill sets or enabling. Yeah, and I mean, it's fascinating when you mention that, that the creation of the EPA, because there is a lot of doomsterism around at the moment. And I'm afraid I, I, I'm, maybe I'm imbued by that sunny Californian Reaganite optimism that still stays with me from my childhood. But when you look at the way the creation of the EPA, the creation of other agencies, and ultimately the creation of early markets has gone on in the environmental area. Not only are you the father of these markets, but they've had really marked successes we talk about. Yeah, they have been. And and again, Patrick, look, you as the author of a of a capital markets revolution, and we came into, to get back to your original question, you know, it's Victor Hugo. Nothing is as powerful as as an idea whose time has come. And we were a group of people uh, that were open to change in a unique way. You know, it was people like you, men like you, women like Ann Berg, and an interesting group of people whose outsider sensibilities were allowed to move an industry. And this outsider sensibility created a revolution that would have never occurred, in my humble opinion, and I think your humble opinion, had it been establishment bound. Yes, yes, yes. But it, I mean, it's quite fascinating because you look at, well, <clears throat> I mean, the great wonder of acid rain. I mean, at one point in time, we were all petrified that we were going to be a gray drizzling day such as today in Gibraltar would be more acid than water. And yet markets essentially did a great deal to try and cure that. And you were at the epicenter of it. Yeah, it was kind of funny too, Patrick, because another one of these right time, right places, um, I had uh, been toiling away in the financial derivatives and and I was approached in the late 80s by a group of lime producers. <laughs> and the <laughs> and and they had formed something called the Coalition for Acid Rain Equity, CARE. 
and it was CARE's mission to support an act which would cap the amount of sulfur emissions in the United States. Well, why on God's green earth would lime producers be so driven? Well, it turns out that there's a chemical factory, it's called a scrubber, in which you pass flue grass through, and if it has lime in it, it sucks the sulfur out of the flue gas, and so the emissions of sulfur are reduced and therefore sulfur can't get into the atmosphere combined with oxygen and then have water and produce acid rain. At that time, acid rain it was the apocalypse. You know, there were movies called Black Rain by Michael Douglas, you know, as a metaphor for the ends of time and the apocalypse. And, and so, there was this need, you know, much like I think it must have looked in World War II when, you know, London was shrouded in, in this pollution. Pittsburgh was like that and Chicago was like that and upstate New York was getting defoliated and, and the rivers were becoming acidic. and. Somebody, they said to me, well, you commoditized interest rates and managed to turn them into commodity. Can you do that with air? And I said, for sure, you know. Um, and, and so I wrote a paper, advocated for it. Jim Thompson, who was governor of Illinois, that, that was on the board and he knew... Uh, Riley, who was Bill, who was the head of the EPA, we went in to see them and we convinced them the legislation had to have continuous emission monitors because the speculators would need to know emissions to be able to trade in the market. It couldn't be asymmetric information. And ultimately, uh, Patrick, the act was passed and the Board of Trade uh, conducted and won the right to do pro bono auctions. And uh, we did, the uh, environmental financial products predecessor did the first trade. And I think that's worthwhile to discuss for a moment if you think it's okay. Mm -hmm. Please, please, please. Go ahead. People think that you go and you buy and sell gold and you buy and sell SO2 emissions the same way. And they don't think of the futures market as a financing mechanism. And what happened was we came uh across we and uh, had a joint venture with Zurich Insurance and a subsidiary called Centuri and we found a municipal utility in Kentucky that was building a scrubber you know that would use lime etc and they were going to enjoy the privilege of working with a renowned investment banker who would provide and help them with inner construction financing and ultimately financing $25 million, which they didn't have for the scrubber. So we said to them, look, how about this? Why don't you cancel the financing with your investment banker and I will present value your reductions for decades and buy them now and give you the 25 million. So you can forget putting the city in debt and we'll take in uh, those uh, emissions reductions and we will principal them, which we did. 
And then we found an, another utility that couldn't build a scrubber because a scrubber requires acres of land. So mm -hmm. they needed to permanently have enough credits in their account so they can continue to operate their utility, not fire people, not close down. And so they had a cost of capital. So we created a zero at their cost of capital and sold them a stream of allowance reductions and financed with a zero coupon and backed into the sulfur price. So the first financing was in effect, uh, or the first trade was a financing of a scrubber. It really wasn't the buying and selling. And then we had this enormous problem that the EPA registry wasn't up. So there was a wonderful administrator who passed recently, Brian McLean, Brian, wherever you are, God bless you, uh, a wonderful man. And we work with him developing the registry. So I had the deal set, but I could have really been chopped in pieces because the EPA registry wasn't finished and I didn't know when it would be finished. So we did the deal and I turned to the derivatives toolkit and we bought some bond options and Fortunately, race went the right way in the trade, and we consummated it with uh, the opening of the registry. So this whole uh, thing, if you look, it says buy and sell, and it looks like Center Financial Products bought some, and it sold it to Carolina Power and Light, and, and it looks like it was a simple trade. But it was a year of unhedged, volatile rates, unknown price discovery. But markets work. They have eyeballs. You know, they can see things. And this was a perfect example about how financial engineering could result in profitability and social good. And that's so interesting because, I mean, obviously, one of your books was actually, uh, if I recall correctly, it was Derivatives for Good or Markets for Good, you called it. And, and it was talking about exactly that precept. And therefore, perhaps, well, let's uh, let's offer a couple of, first of all, some proclamation by acclamation by one of the world's leading commodity experts. Anne Berg is back. Happy to see your wit and intellect on full display, Richard. Aren't we all, Anne? I think it's absolutely magnificent to see. And it's so good that you could join us today. Now, moving down through the generations, here's a tricky question for you, oh, father of financial futures. Hello, Richard, says Natalie Lianto. What is your proudest achievement in your career so far? I think uh, the proudest achievement is been to be a teacher. Um, Patrick, that's what I started out to do. I mean, I wanted to, you know, enrich young minds. I still teach. I have, um, this is my 60th anniversary of teaching at the college level, Patrick. Whoa. Uh, and my first cl class was in uh, the summer of 63 um, at uh, a Brooklyn College. And I taught an introduction to economics micro. And I think over the years, whether I've... Um, Natalie uh, watched uh, students of mine go on and, and write PhDs on climate change uh, most recently, or watched former employees. At one point, I think 30% of the CEOs in the top 10 FCMs were my former men and women who worked for me at the beginning. And so... I think it's fun to do things and to be first and to be getting your peers 
to recognize what you've done, but it's even more fun to see your students enjoy that. So that's been my greatest uh, achievement. I think that's a wonderful thing to say, Richard, but I also think you're being far too modest, my dear friend, with all <laughs> of your great achievements through markets over the course of years. And also, of course, privately building up your world class photographic collection, which made your uh, makes you made a visit to your Chicago apartment. So absolutely enchanting from start to finish. I, rem I remember many years ago. So tell me, Richard, we talk about environmental markets. How do you view them at the moment? I mean, there are certain challenges, but obviously they seem to be gaining huge momentum. I look, I, I think the proposition has been clear. My teacher, Ronald Coase, you know, recognized this first in an article in 1960, and we're only beginning to see the role of emissions trading in combating water shortages, air quality, climate change, et cetera. And so I think the best is yet to come. I just got back from a weekend in China and lecturing at Fudan and speaking at Tsinghua and the Asian banker. And I think we are going to be surprised, Patrick. I'll go out on a limb here. And uh, I think we don't hear much about what China is doing, but you, this is typically their way. But the uh, go and speak at the campuses, and they're no different than college campuses here, where climate change and the earth is a matter of importance. And nothing happens in China, nothing happens in China, and then all of a sudden, you know, new stadiums emerge, high speed trains emerge, you know, Olympic venues emerge, a Belt and Road initiative emerges. And I think one day China will be on board with emissions markets and they will be the biggest in the world. And that will be the beginning of the end of climate change as a problem. It's fascinating because I, I would agree with you, certainly once we can all log into AliExpress and Alibaba, the source of so much industrial production, and simultaneously hedge our carbon footprint at the same time over whatever it may be that we're buying. That will certainly be a revolutionary moment in the in the development of carbon markets. Yeah, I look, I, I think that just as a student of markets, as you and I, you know, we, we get a rush into something everybody sees a shiny new toy they recognize it's going to solve all the problems and then all of a sudden the toy is broken or it contains lead and it poisons children and then we clean up the toy and the toy works and i think environmental markets sustainability esg you know it, all have to go through ebbs and flows of public acceptance, criticism, and then adoption, you know, and, and you know, Schopenhauer said the truth goes through thir first three versions in the, in the first, uh, you know, it is rejected as absurd. In the second, it is violently opposed. And in the third, it is accepted as self-evident. <laughs> and, and, you know, I, <laughs> and, and I think the Schopenhauer, you know, notion uh, of environmental markets will fall into that category. Right now, we have carbon credits being done and and i watched it when i worked on the first you know esg index which ultimately yeah, the swiss mutual fund uh called the sustainable sam asset management and we did our own sustainability and same thing you know rejected or dismissed uh, as absurd you know 
violently opposed, now accepted, now it's burnished a little, it'll come back. And so we have all of these things that are like markets. They come in ebbs and flows and, and there's charlatans and there's people who abuse it. And But a well-regulated environmental market subject to independent verification things of this nature ultimately will help us combat the shortage of what are called natural resources air water etc and that of course has been an incredible period of your career but most recently you developed some really, really fascinating interest rate products, again, somewhat against the grain, because you did so during this amazing mania called quantitative easing, just when interest rates once again had fallen out of favor. And, and nowadays, I think a whole generation of interest rate traders think 4% is a staggeringly high interest rate and are having paroxysms as we reach five and more percent in American mortgages at the moment. But Tell us a bit about that. I mean, that was a very, very interesting product that you developed through your American financial exchange. Yeah, that, that was, Patrick, the same sort of thing. It was in 2011, um, a friend of mine called me up, as you know, Patrick and, and the other folks in the Chicago community call me uh, Doc, and I will ultimately get a call and, they, and it will say, hey, Doc, have you thought about this? Or I want that alert. And I got a call, one of those, hey, Doc calls in 2011. <laughs> and, and the hey doc was, did I hear that Royal Bank of Scotland had fired a group of people for manipulating LIBOR? And I said, and you know, there are epiphanies that uh, what psychologists call the aha moment. This was an aha moment for me. Um, because I said, well, once they start firing their own and eating their young, this is the beginning of the end. Because even I know if, if a bank is firing somebody for manipulation, there has to be somebody they manipulated with. <laughs> so that means there's two manipulators. And even to a naive student of mathematics, if there are two, there are going to be four. And if there are four, there are going to be eight. And so I figured we need to come up with an alternative to LIBOR. Um, I uh, gave a paper at the World Federation of Exchanges in 2012, said this is the beginning of the end, and decided that the way to approach the problem was not with the money center banks, the, the four that control it, but was to pay attention to the 5,000 other banks in the United States. Um, and that they borrowed at credit sensitive rates and they are the ones that needed a benchmark that reflected their own borrowing and lending. So I got out the old playbook, you know, that I had gone to Mississippi to mortgage bankers, and now I went to Arkansas to regional and community banks. And I ate a lot of pulled pork ribs <laughs> and, and barbecue <laughs> and, and, and went to see, you know, banks in Tupelo and then proceeded to go with my young people to Elvis Presley's house, Patrick. <laughs> <laughs> and managed to be St. Louis Ribs in Memphis, 
pulled pork and and things of this nature and and rural south and it was a lot of fun ultimately pulled together about uh, five trillion uh in assets about a quarter of america's banking system set up a central banking platform where they could borrow and lend for each other and then ultimately the average rate that they borrowed and lent became a maribor um, and, uh, now we sold that business to a London, uh, hedge fund, uh, a private equity firm, and they're taking it. I, I enjoy the Patrick, as you know, well, I'm, a, I'm, I'm kind of have a lot of fun tranting, planting trees and also watering saplings. I'm not so good and I don't have as much fun trimming branches. <laughs> and so <laughs> my core competency is to invest and then sell. And 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 this is what we did. And so I, I got a couple of other big challenges, uh, work in China, a few other ideas that, that I, I I don't want to share with you at this particular point till they're uh, ripe, but you know, there's so much more to do. There's so much that that markets can offer, and in a world in which people don't believe in incentives and 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 are loathe to recognize the value of markets. I think the opportunities yep. have never been bigger. Here, here, Richard Sander, I think the opportunities have never been bigger. And I think the opportunities, large and small, are enormous. When you talked about the, at the start of the show about auction markets, I mean, I think we're only scratching the surface of what we can use for price discovery, which are deploying sensibly created and nurtured auction markets for all manner of different products. Um, I think we've grown rather too confident that all markets must be super liquid these days, where actually injecting a little liquidity into a marketplace can be not a dangerous thing, an absolutely wonderful thing for transparency and users. No, and we're we're beginning and everybody said, well, what else can you do? You know, you got, you've pushed the boundary and there's air and water. Well, I teach a course at the University of Chicago and I ask the students, to do two things, um, then naturally they need to understand markets and, and there are some fundamentals, but they ask them to do a class paper. And the, the class paper is, is one in which they identify what economists call an externality, a market failure. And and then they come up with a way to solve it and invent a market. Um, Patrick, uh, just to give you an idea, they range from this past year, a cap and trade market for space junk. OK, which, <gasps> marvelous, which is just marvelous, a cap and trade system for prison population to incentivize legislators to change sentencing guidelines that optimize the use uh, of, uh, and costs of, of incarceration versus equity and justice. A market-based solutions to judiciaries that are too imbalanced with Republicans and Democrats and how to create an exchange system for Supreme Court appointments versus appellate, appellate appointments versus local judges. The imagination is endless for, yep. for new ways to identify incentives to deal with resource allocation that's both privately owned and publicly owned. So, and, 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 indeed, and you add to that, you know, AI and monitoring and verification and miniaturization 
The next 100 years prom- or the next 50 years promised to be as productive as 75 was to now, for the last 50 years of the CFTC and financial, why wouldn't the next 50 years be as rich? I think you're quite right. And actually, I love that idea about space junk uh, because, indeed, next Tuesday, I'm going to be at the Mansion House in London and we're going to be talking, so the Guildhall in London, we're going to be in a private forum which is talking about the City of London's space economy at an event that's being chaired by Mark Wheatley, who was a guest on IPOVID just a few weeks ago. Richard, we could carry on for weeks on end without any difficulty whatsoever. We would starve ourselves to death, but nurtured by such ideas. However, I'm going to have to ask you that burning question. And indeed, you are more actively involved than many, many people because you wrote the forward to capital market revolution. Richard Sander, where does the capital market revolution go next? Well, I, Patrick, you just identified it yourself. How about space? <laughs> How about, you know, all kinds of air control with space travel? How about the purchase of routes, uh, the purchase of gate space, the, the use of, of satellites? Uh, how about social problems, you know? Worlds that we don't imagine. You you may laugh at or 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 wonder about people who like Elon Musk who speaks about populating Mars, but between AI, a world that will be tremendously different, we're gonna need more efficiencies and adaptations of capital markets to meet the, a world that, that will be resource constrained and that will be interplanetary. And and you one may laugh at that, but these are questions that are going to rise. The space junk is the perfect one. We're going to put up more and more pieces up there. They're going to crash into each other. It's like the Wild West now. And the capital markets will expand from both the micro and the miniaturization in the world to the exact opposite to the galaxy of the world. So I think there's never been a reason to be more optimistic and watch the expansion of capital markets. What a wonderfully optimistic note from the father of financial futures, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a joy. Sadly, we are resource constrained by time that we're going to try and fit this all into an hour. But there are so many more hours to come that we could be talking about this for years to come, I think, Richard. Thank you very, very much for joining the show. Thank you so much to those who interacted today with the father of financial futures, Marcus Ward. Great to see you. Natalie Lianto, thank you for a great question. All hail to Anne Berg as well. A great voice and figure in commodities who was talking to us just a week or so ago on this show as well. Let me say thank you very, very much also to our production team, Herminia, Natalie, Fernando. You did a great job today. And also, ladies and gentlemen, All Saints Day tomorrow, so there is no Exchange Invest will be published as everybody is out of the office. I wish everybody a lovely holiday in our offices across the world. I will, however, be in Gibraltar working because such is the lot of the average everyday CEO these days. And indeed, Richard, Thank you. Once again, a magnificent show, ladies and gentlemen. Catch all of the books of Richard Sander, all of his writings. They're just so fascinating altogether. Next week, we're going to be inside the Ice House in London with a fabulous guest coming up from there, of course, the Intercontinental Exchange, another body on whose board Richard Sander formerly sat. My name is Patrick L. Young. I am the Chief Executive of Valerian PLC this week. Gosh, that sounds so exciting to say. Thank you to all our shareholders there. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for watching. And I'll catch up with you in Exchange Invest from Thursday. Richard, thank you for a wonderful show. I wish you all, ladies and gentlemen, a great week in life and markets. Patrick, thank you for the opportunity of visiting with you. You are the best. (laughs) I appreciate it, Richard. Thank you so much.